uh, Oman is comparatively have less uh, per capita consumption of the electricity. Uh, the reason is that if you try to compare Oman with other GCC countries, we come to know that the uh, infrastructure development uh, is little lower uh, to other countries. So yes, we are, pro uh, we are using less electricity, but it's still increasing. Uh, if I try to show you the graph, so you can find that uh, uh, this is Oman. So if you try to see the consumption is steadily increasing, and maybe it will be increasing further because uh, we have more buildings, we have more highways, so for the building we need electricity, the population is increasing, and things like that. And uh, based on that, the uh, consumption is basically uh, slowly increasing. Uh, as I mentioned that the oil and gas is some kind of uh, non-sustainable or non-renewable resources. It means that they have, they have to end at one day. So the, uh, the understanding or the importance to move towards renewable energy is basically huge. I just try to develop this and to see how much, how much oil reserve uh, we have in Oman. So you can see that Oman is having only 5.15 5 uh, billion barrels uh, uh, of oil reserve. Other countries, if they are like looking to Saudi Arabia, so it's the highest one. Even United Arab Emirates and Kuwait have more than Oman. So if some countries, they say, still they are trying to wait uh, for uh, movement towards renewable energy, but in case of Oman, because the reserve is very low compared to other countries, so there is a uh, importance that this country should uh, proceed uh, quickly towards these uh, renewable energy uh, resources. Also, if I try to look at to, uh, uh, the Natural gas reserve, so Oman is again have a small amount of uh, natural reserve. So that also highlight or trigger the uh, importance of moving towards renewable energies. Uh, most, many countries in GCC, like for example, uh, Emirates or UAE, they have tried to uh, uh, consider the nuclear as part of the renewable energy. Qatar also tried to pro produce 20% from the renewable uh, energy resources by uh, 2024. As I mentioned that in Oman, the progress is very slow, but both the vision, uh, vision uh, 2020 and 2040, uh, they press on the importance of the renewable energies and they want to reduce uh, dependency on the oil and gas. We have different forms of uh, renewable energy which can be utilized not only in Oman, but in most uh, area of the world. So we have solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, and waves or tidals which can be adopted. Uh, so I'm going to uh, see that how much, uh, if the case can be developed for the biomass, so how much energy can be produced in Oman and what could be the uh, percentage which can be covered by the biomass resources. Uh, the overall uh, biomass electricity which has been produced by biomass was uh, 370 uh, terawatt hours uh, in 2016. There are different kind of resources which can be used as a uh, biomass, like for example, wood and wood plants, agriculture crops, uh, municipal solid, organic waste, animal waste, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I know that animal waste has been used as a form of producing energy by a traditional way, and most of you have seen if you are coming from rural area. Uh, and also, uh, in Jordan there was a case then, uh, uh, which has been uh, mentioned that 847 per, uh, gigawatt hour electricity can be produced by a biomass. This is a recent research which has been taken in 2017. This is a typical uh, uh, type of the uh, plant which can be used for the production of the electricity uh, from biomass. This is a little different from the traditional one because in the traditional one we take the, let's say for example, animal waste, so we try to burn it because it has some amount of methane or th things like that which can produce the electricity. Uh, the, in the animal, basically, I try to cover two uh, parts uh, or two ways uh, for the pro, uh, in this article for the production of electricity. I covered the animal uh, mirror and also the waste from the water treatment uh, plant. 
In the animal waste, we have the, our tyc solid, which is 75% uh, or 0.7 of the total waste. And also in the waste which is coming from the wastewater treatment, which is also give a yield of uh, 315 to uh, 400 uh, meter cube per ton. I try to look at to uh, see that how much uh, uh, more we can get from the uh, animal or we can get from the animals which we are having in different region. So I try to get the, I try to use the data of the Ministry of uh, Fisheries which is basically dealing with the uh, uh, animals and I found that, uh, I selected cows, camels, goats and sheep and I see how many animals we are having in each region and I try to get the total number of each uh, sheep that how much animal more we can produce from uh, these number of the uh, animals. Then I try to see that if for example I take a cow and I just approximately see that the weight of the cow is let's say 250 and then the same weight I selected for the camel as well. Consider the goat as 25 kilogram and the sheep. This is approximation it may be some may have more weight or some may have less weight. So I try to uh, calculate that how much waste uh, or manure can be produced by each animal and then I try to uh, see the uh, waste which is the total years and then I try to convert it into the yield uh, for years. Uh, so I assume that the total uh, water dioxide uh, uh, will be uh, this amount and the production of the electricity can be translated to uh, 2600 uh, gigawatt per year. So this is just kind of uh, a theoretical calculation of the uh, production of electricity from the animal manure. Then I also try to look at to the waste from the uh, wastewater treatment. So the capacity which was actually in uh, in 2008, uh, this graph is showing that how much we were having in Muscat. Uh, then we have a big region. One is Muscat and the other one is Halala and remaining is the rest of uh, Oman. Uh, so the total is, uh, this is the 2008 data but by the end of 2016 it was projected that this amount of uh, waste can be produced by the uh, wastewater treatment. I also try to translate this uh, uh, theoretically towards the production of electricity and I, at the end I come that uh, 47 gigawatt for uh, gigawatt hours can be produced by the uh, waste which we are getting from the waste water treatment. Initially both of the waste is, uh, uh, is basically not used, we just use it for the, uh, I mean to grow the plants only. Uh, so these two, if I try to combine it, both of them, uh, I come to a conclusion that uh, we can produce 10% of the total electricity requirement uh, from biomass, which is from two sources. One is, uh, one is the animal manure and the other one is the waste of the water. Of course, uh, there is a, uh, there is an environmental factor which we can uh, be considered because the location of the plant uh, where we are going to set the plant, this is one of the issues and also uh, if I try to make a plant because uh, as you see in the table, the waste can be, the waste is basically allocated in different regions. So there is an issue that uh, if we put one or two plants, so how these uh, waste can be transferred to that area. So there is an issue of the collection methodologies or connection, uh, collection of waste mechanism. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, the waste water treatment, uh, we have one in Oman and one in Salala. So again, there is a, pos there is a challenge is how these plants can be, uh, or how this waste can be, uh, uh, can be collected at one location where the uh, plant can be uh, uh, can be established and also there is a uh, there is an issues of the financial issues because these plant normally have huge costs so we need to consider that as well. Uh, I am going to finish now uh, the whole conclusion is that it is possible that 10 percent of the electricity con uh, uh, consumption can be supported by uh, biomass or 
uh, waste from animal and wastewater treatment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tarek, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I have a quick question before I open uh, the floor for the questions. Uh, you mentioned in your last slide that there are some uh, social and environmental aspects. I'm interested in the social aspects which are affecting uh, the uh, deployment of biomass or the integration of biomass in the energy generation in Oman. Uh, have you touched upon that or uh, you uh, have well, any information uh, about that? I, I haven't touched that point, but it's basically a social understanding, yes. Uh, which source can provide you a quick energy? Like, for example, if I, tr if I try to convince the uh, decision-making people or the government organization, it's very difficult that you tell them that you invest this much and you will get only 10% of the total electricity uh, which you are using. Uh, and also, uh, the social factor is basically, uh, there is need an, uh, of an awareness that how much energy is important for us. Like, for example, we go to the, we just leave the room open and we don't switch off the light or we don't switch off the AC. Uh, the reason is that because the electricity is very cheaper in this region because it is highly subsidized by the government. Uh, so nobody cares if I just leave the AC on because I, the bill is affordable, is not too much, but uh, we need to keep this in mind that more than 50% is basically supported by the government. Uh, so there is also, uh, this is the social issues, and uh, of course there, is a, uh, there are issues in terms of acceptance uh, when you try to convince the decision making. So you know, you have to present the case in that way that that can be realized and can be accepted as well. Like for example, nobody cares that uh, when you told them that the oil and gas can be finished, but nobody is uh, uh, willing to listen to this argument. Uh, the reason is that it will finish, but it will take some time, you know. And the question is when it will finish, then what will be the solution? So these are some kind of solution which biomass is one of them. All right, thanks, uh, Dr. Tore. Uh, any questions? Thank you for your wonderful presentation, but I have some clarifications I'd like to share with you. First of all, in your uh, design for the power plant, you were discussing gasification as a source to feed the boiler or the firebox with the gas. Why you go to gasification and not to anaerobic fermentation to get biogas? In biogas, you will have as a secondary byproduct the digestate, which can be used as a fertilizer for the agriculture. So why you choose gasification? Yes, uh, the, the reason is that actually I'm not uh, an expert in that uh, specific okay. type of plants. Uh, by profession, I'm a civil engineer, uh, so this is some kind of issues which Sorry, be related. I understand. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, so you are right one. that uh, just that you are right that there can be different types of plant which can be utilized. Mm. It's not only necessary the plant which I have mm. mentioned here that can be utilized. It's not necessary. Okay, from logistic point of view, it will be interesting to know the average volume per site. For example, you are still giving us the total number of animals from this type and this type and this type. This is not enough. I need to know for which farm, how many pieces of these animals are exist, because this will give you an idea about the distribution, and then you can tackle centralized versus decentralized plant. Yes, uh, uh, but uh, when you get the number of animals, so it is most possibly where you have more, uh, many animals in specific region, so most possibly the plant can be uh, established in that area. Uh, because I use the uh, data which is I take from the Ministry of Fisheries in Oman, mm. that is the only organization which is basically handling their data. If you ask me to go and count uh, or to get the number of animals from each region, it's very difficult, you know, or if you want to go, because these animals is basically owned by the uh, general public as well. It's not only the government uh, ownership so that's why i use the ministry data which is i okay. feel that may be reliable last one is there is always a competition between taking this biomass for electric power generation and taking this biomass as an alternative fuel in cement plant why didn't you consider this also uh, because i try to focus on the electricity generation that's mm. why i just focus on the electricity. Okay, yes. I'd like to give you something from my own experience. Usually, burning alternative fuel in cement plant, more economic than making incineration followed by power generation. 
most possibly. Much more economic. Yes, most possibly, yes, you are right. So you are saying that we can use this waste rather than produce the electricity, we can use this waste in the pro, uh, production of cement as well. Yes, it is possible, yes. All right, uh, the time remaining is enough for uh, one more presentation by uh, Dr. Uh, Tarek. So he's going to present to us uh, another paper, a review of geothermal energy resources for electricity generation uh, in Oman. I just come to the specific time, the, uh, the specific where the ex executive this presentation is starting, because the initial slide which is basically highlighting the uh, importance of energy or the uh, use of energy in GCC's countries are almost the same. Uh, so in this next presentation, I'm trying to use the geothermal resources uh, for the electricity generation. A geothermal uh, resources basically laying under the ground or under, under the earth. If you try to look at to the earth, it has uh, different several parts, but as you go deeper and deeper, uh, the structure of the earth is changing and of course the temperature of the earth is also uh, changing. Uh, based on the geological, we can classify the earth uh, into different layers. So the outer layer which we are living is basically called the crust. After the crust, we have mantle, outer core, and inner core. As you go down uh, towards deeper area, so the temperature is basically uh, increasing. So uh, in, the, in terms of geothermal resources, is basically the concept to take the heat from the earth and try to utilize that heat for the production of electricity. So I try to look at that, that how much is the possibility of the production of electricity if we get uh, that heat from the earth. Uh, again, it's like, uh, it's not the new concept. Many countries are using, uh, like Iceland is producing 50% uh, of the uh, electricity requirement from the geothermal resources. And also in Canada, they are using it for the heating of their rooms or uh, their buildings. So most of the countries, they are using the uh, geothermal resources and there is possibility uh, for using the geothermal resources in Oman. Uh, there is one kind of uh, issues which is uh, very, uh, I mean, which is not very simple. Uh, the reason is that we need to try to investigate uh, as much as you go deeper. So what is the maximum temperature you can get? So there is an issue of exploration, uh, and which is basically costly as well. But what I have done in this uh, uh, article, basically, I try to get the data from the petroleum development in Oman, uh, which is basically working for the exploration of the oil and gas. So when they get something from the earth, they try to uh, analyze it. And uh, during their analysis process, one of the component, basically, they try to check what is the temperature of the substance which they are getting from the earth. So I try to use that, and I try to pound that, yes, it is possible that to use that uh, heat or temperature or that fluid, basically, to produce uh, electricity from geothermal resources. This is the simple concept that how does it work? So like for example, we have rain, so the water maybe penetrate inside where the surface is uh, permeable. So the water can penetrate inside. As this water go inside, uh, because the lower temperature is hot because of you know the lower surface, uh, I just mentioned it here. Uh, this is in the form of magma, which has high temperature. So it's normally the temperature transfer and it heat up this water, uh, which become like a fluid. And this fluid, if we try to extract this fluid and try to use it, like for example, if I try to convert it, like if I get the fluid which has, um, let's say, 80 degrees centigrade temperature, so it will be easy to convert it into steam. And that steam, if we try to accumulate it uh, in a tar uh, in, a, in an area and then we try to use it for rotation of the turbine so it could be easy and it could be economical rather than we just use uh, an ordinary water. Uh, geothermal resources, uh, there was a classification based on the temperature so as much as the temperature is high based on that temperature the geothermal resources can be classified and also their production uh, as well. Uh, based on the temperature, the geothermal plant can be also classified in three categories. This is the first, uh, which is called dry or direct stream. Uh, 
under its own temperature of the earth. Uh, when the water go inside the earth, so it is automatically converted into the steam. So in this type of plants is basically to extract that steam and to accumulate it and then try to use it in the turbine. And when the turbine try to rotate, this can rotate uh, or it can generate the electricity. Uh, this steam can be, uh, when the uh, pressure can be reduced, it can be converted into the water again and that water can be injected back to the earth surface. So in this situation that uh, the plant can become uh, sustainable. Whatever you are getting from the earth, uh, you are trying to return the same thing to the earth. Uh, there is also possibility when you try to get this steam or this fluid, so it may have some kind of useful uh, minerals are useful element which can be extracted at this location uh, when you are trying to bring this steam upward. There is a next type of uh, production plant. There is a problem basically uh, this type of, uh, yes it can be utilized because but the problem is that it needs uh, high temperature to convert this uh, steam or to get this steam. So they are very rare or it is basically adopted very rarely. The second one is splash steam uh, geothermal. If we have the fluid temperature around 182 degrees centigrade, it can be used. So when you get, uh, when we get this uh, uh, production well, we can get uh, two things. One is the fluid and the other is the water. So if we get the fluid, we can directly use it in the turbine, but if we get water, then we can try to uh, heat it up further and try to convert it into the steam. And then again, the steam can be used in the turbine to uh, generate or to produce the electricity. And then the cooling process will convert uh, the steam into water and then it can be injected back to the earth. Uh, similarly, we have the third type, like for example, if you have a temperature less than 100 degrees centigrade, then this kind of uh, plant can be used. It's like a range of uh, 85 to 175. So again, it's, like, it's called binary cycle power plant. Uh, and again, uh, the same process can be adopted. Uh, if the temperature is lower, the temperature can be increased and the steam can be produced. And that steam can be used for uh, rotating the turbine. And again, it will be injected back to the earth surface. Now. The first thing is that uh, when I realize that it really it can be used in Oman or not, so we have different types of spring in Oman, which is normally called hot spring. Uh, there are more than 360, and uh, this one is basically people go to visit. It is like a tourist place, and the temperature is like, uh, it is on the earth's surface, and the temperature is 45 degrees centigrade. So it's like an indication. If you go lower, maybe the temperature will be uh, more, but the question is again, it's need the exploration. And what I have is only, uh, I have only the uh, PDO data which I can utilize. Uh, from the PDO data, this is the exploration area where the PDO basically do their operation in uh, Oman. Uh, and this data basically re reveals that the temperature of the sample which they are getting is more than 100. Uh, degree centigrade. It's mean we can use the third type of plant uh, to produce the electricity from the geothermal resources. I try to look at to uh, how many uh, bore holes which we are having. So I try to look at that how much is the temperature of uh, each area or each exploration area where we have more than 100 degrees centigrade. Uh, so as you can see the temperature here is like uh, more than all, more than 100, and, uh, 100 degrees centigrade. And the total numbers of the bore is uh, 55, which I use. There are other holes as well, but because the temperature is lower than the requirement, so I just try to ignore that. Uh, also there is uh, issues, uh, again, yes, it can be used for the production of electricity, but there is a, uh, there are issue of the cost of the plant. So I just try to get a chart which can compare what is the possible cost of the, this kind of plant if we try to use. So you can see that uh, geothermal dual flash and geothermal binary is the same, uh, has, has the same cost. But if we try to look at to the solar, the solar cost is more than 
the geothermal, also the hydro uh, small scale uh, uh, dams is also more than uh, geothermal. The wind is also little more than the geothermal as well. Uh, so it is possible or it can be uh, used, this kind of plant to produce electricity. This cost is basically per megawatt hour. Uh, the geothermal cost can be, uh, uh, can be distributed in different uh, components, like we need to have the exploration, uh, then we need to have a, a confirmation, drillings, power plant, and then the transmission as well. Uh, so this is like uh, a typical cost break off of the uh, geothermal power plant. Uh, the conclusion is that, yes, we have a 55 bore hole, which is uh, from the PDO data, Petroleum Development Home 1, which has more than 100 degrees centigrade, and the binary plant can be used to produce electricity from uh, those resources. Uh, this will help to reduce the dependency on oil and gas. Uh, the problem is that, as I mentioned, that I use the uh, PDO data, uh, so the PDO data is basically they are trying to look at for the oil and gas reserve. Their objective is not to look at to the temperature or their initial objective is not uh, basically related to the geothermal. So therefore we need, uh, there is a need of uh, more reliable uh, data as well. Uh, environmental impact uh, can need to be considered because uh, maybe uh, the area which I mentioned, which is uh, like uh, in Muscat, which is the capital, and uh, when we are going to put a plant like this, again we need to look at to the environmental, which could be noise pollution, the water use and quality, because when you are trying to inject the water, so uh, also we need to consider how much land will be used, uh, and there is also an impact of natural phenomena and wildlife, because in somehow, uh, the environment will, will be affected uh, uh, and also the plantation and things like that can be or need to be uh, considered. Uh, so in this article actually I try to look at to the uh, use of geothermal to produce the electricity and that is the end if you want to have any. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tarek, for these two presentations. Um, um, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Anybody has any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you have portrayed that uh, thermal you know, energy could be potential. Is there any risk by over utilizing these resources that we, we too much are interfering in the geomorphology of the Earth itself. We have already advanced before, like, you know, space exploration and so on, and after some time we start realizing there is also problem on this one and so on. So what are the risks which could be associated with this energy type? Yes, there is always risk uh, when you are trying to go for something new which has not been tried before. So yes, the risk is there because if I'm going to put a plant, you know, so yes, I mentioned that the temperature is well enough, but it means I need to have sufficient amount of the fluid which can run uh, the plant for a maximum duration. Like for example, if I can get the fluid and which can help me to run the plant only for one hour, which is totally uneconomical. Yes, I need to have that fluid amount sufficient which can help me to run the plant. So this is one kind of the risk. Uh, uh, the next kind of risk is like, uh, you can say it's related to the financial or economic. Like for example, uh, it's like an experimental base, you know, or, uh, at least uh, if I try to develop a, or establish a plant, so we need to see that what will be the output of that plant. It would be uh, helpful or it would not be helpful. So there are issues which is related to the cost, which is like a risk factor. Maybe the plant will fail. I would be able to use it for one year, and then I will come to the conclusion that the cost of electricity is too much, and it is not adoptable now. But uh, the overall thing is basically, it, this is a source of the energy which could be possibly utilized. So 
in maybe not now, but in future, maybe we need to shift it when we will not having any oil and gas resources. So then that will be the time when we need to see the alternative resources. Uh, so it's better to prepare for now and what, how to proceed that uh, aim or that vision uh, in future. Uh, any more questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. And since I'm from a physics background, I have some queries. Uh, we know we used to take the hot spots, so, and we know uh, the core, and we have the tectonic plates, and over that we have the water table. So why can't we uh, tap this uh, water table? water so that it can be rerouted to the tectonic plates and that hot spots can be utilized to make it to steam or high pressure vapor and it can be uh, transferred to the turbines so that it can run faster. Exactly, yes, uh, you are right that the problem is that, uh, you know, that exploration stage is very crucial because when you try to take the boring, so maybe your machine will fail because in some area the surface is so hard even your machine can fail. So that exploration stage is very important uh, that you would be able to penetrate that much deeper or not is the surface is soft enough or is the surface is not allowing to penetrate inside. So yes, that is an issue but because uh, uh, I just used the uh, PDO data, it means that they have done the exploration. So in the PDO definitely there sometimes their bore can fail, so they have to find an alternative uh, location to make their bores or holes. So yes, there is a risk, I mean, uh, for failure of the bore holes as well, yes? All right. Um, yeah. I want to thank you for the presentation, but I missed the, the, the first part of your presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, have you done any uh, work in, in, in the GCC areas in this, in this regard? Or, and what is, what's your experience? This is my first question. And the second thing, how many units do you need actually to power one building of 100 flats in it? Uh, well, uh, it's basically depending on the types of plant which you are going to select and then uh, the plant can be bigger and the plant can be smaller. Uh, if you are asking me that did I have work uh, something like uh, on ground, this work is very costly, you know, even I would not be able to get my own data because for that you need to do the boring and exploration which is too much costly and, you know, without the government support it is not possible. Uh, yes, this is basically uh, the initial data which I have obtained from the PDO and this is basically only related to the temperature because the, the first or the starting point is basically to see is there is any potential or not, is there is a, a hot fluid available to use that plant or not. So I just explore the data or I just obtain the data from the PDO. Uh, there is no plant which has been established throughout the GCC uh, so far. Excuse me, I just would like to comment on uh, Professor Ashraf. Uh, not in GCC, but uh, we have a project in Malaysia. We, I am engaged in to do a similar project like that. And in such a case, we are not talking about a small power generation for one building of uh, 100 flat or something. We are talking about mega power. We can generate 100 mega, 200 mega, 600 mega. This is what we are looking at. So such technology is not used for small or medium power generation. It should be above hundreds of megas. Well, uh, actually, that, that might relate. I know where Dr. Ashraf is coming from in terms of that question. It's because uh, we're, our background is architecture, so it might be related to the, for example, the small scale, like in terms of like, heating and cooling, heating the spaces, for example. Have you touched upon that? Uh, uh, well, uh, I haven't touched, but as I mentioned that uh, uh, basically I focus on the electricity generation. So electricity generation would not be applicable for one or two house or for one building or two building. It will be like at national level. So maybe you can, uh, yes. So it's. I'm concerned about the urban city. Yes, but if you look at two uh, GCC's countries, you know, 
the population in one kilometer area, a square kilometer area, is comparatively low if you are trying to compare to Western or some other countries which are highly populated. So the area is not an issue. Uh, and the thing is like, uh, as I mentioned, that it is not if we are going to produce electricity, so it is not only to produce electricity for one or two house, it's basically like at national level. So maybe in Oman, how much is the electricity requirement and based on that, how much fluid is available in that area and based on that, the decision of the plant can be taken, that hot, what kind of capacity you need. Uh, but it's not only the capacity of the plant, to run that plant, do you have that sufficient fluid or not? So it's something like uh, many things can be correlated and uh, uh, urbanization is an issue, but I think uh, we would not have a, uh, I mean, this is not a problem in the GCC countries. We have enough open space which can accommodate the plant uh, or to uh, establish a plant in a specific area. But again, there is a challenge. Uh, and there is a need of exploration further, you know, so it could be. Just to support the point uh, Tarek is making, in, in London, uh, at London South Bank University, we've teamed up with uh, some engineers to carry out a project called BEN, um, Balanced Energy Network, where we have dug deep almost uh, one mile down um, because one of the issues you have in London it's every 10 years London increases by 1 million population so um, we, we are working to see how we support the, nat the nat national grid in terms of energy consumption and the government in trying to meet its target in terms of a uh, reduction in carbon footprint and trying to make sense of energy we are now going down using geothermal to see how we can support um, this uh, issue. So at uh, London South Bank University, we have received uh, four million pounds from government to carry out a project, a live project as I speak, um, taking place to make sure that water is brought, energy to cool the whole um, London South Bank University during the winter, and that is stored so that during the um, um, winter period, we convert that cold into warm to absolutely distribute. But you have to look at the economics of it. I don't think it makes sense to one building or, or two buildings. You're talking about a whole community or a local area. So it works, but uh, the, the risks are what you are saying. Not just the machinery for today, it's how you maintain and keep the machinery for many, many years to come. They are, yes, you are right. They are, they are using for their own house heating, yes? Yeah, that's Something right. Something like that, yes. But we can't actually, every single borehole, you have to have to only power only five to six to six unit flats, that's all. It should be different. Yes. Such a case, you don't to reach the magma. You just take tens of liters, make some water pipes, and collect the heat for the home. That's right, yes. So yeah, with this uh, vibrant discussion, I think we'll leave it there because uh, the lunch is starting, so we can take it over to lunch and continue the discussion there. Thank you very much uh, for this vibrant uh, discussion, and see you all at lunch. Our first presenter will be Dr. Muhammad Yusuf. So, Dr. Muhammad Yusuf, actually, he is the uh, he is very active uh, researcher where he has published uh, a, a lot of paper in different uh, journals, in uh, uh, journals. And uh, he is uh, working currently as the director of, uh, for the di uh, director for the admin and finance in uh, Applied Science University. Uh, Dr. Mohammed has uh, also a uh, work experience regarding to the teaching and administrative, uh, administrative work in several uh, organization before. So I will uh, welcome Dr. Muhammad, I will call Dr. Muhammad to present his paper. So the time will be just 10 minutes for, for him to present and then we will give five minutes for the QA. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to welcome everybody for this uh, conference. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm working as a, a VP for admin and finance in the, in the university. <laughs> Okay, uh, 
our presentation now for staff perception for, uh, of the link between HR practices and the organization performance as study of Bahraini private university. Overview for the uh, presentation. Historical background. We are we usually talking about the history of uh, HR uh, starting from the personal management administrative functions and going with the uh, human resource management to reach to strategic human resource management. The big question, however, is how does the link between human resource management practices according with the organization performance? And this is what we want to see in this slide. The black box usually for the human resource is talking about something, how to measure the relationship between the human resource practices with the organization performance. If you can see here, there is uh, HR practices between in the, uh, in the black box, but usually uh, the authors and the researchers, they try to find out what exactly inside in this black box, but still the research is going with this uh, study. Uh, we have here the theoretical model. We have usually put the HRM, uh, with which uh, uh, human resource management practices, and we're trying to find out the direct relationship between the human resource management practices through the organization, the direct relationship between human resource management practices to organization performance and the indirect way between the human resource management practices through the employee commitment, organization culture, employee retention, reaching to organization and performance. Uh, human resource practices, we have uh, recruitment or we selected a human resource practices, uh, recruitment and selection, training and development, contingent pay and reward scheme, uh, performance appra appraisal, employee relation, and involvement. Mediating variable, uh, we have employee co commitment, organization culture, employee retention. This is for mediating variables. The big question also, which is the most difficult to find out the relation, again, the relationship between the human resource practice and the organization culture. And this is the difficult question to measure, to measure it. How to, to find the measurement, the proper measurement between human resource, the perception of a human resource management practice and the organization performance. Here, we, uh, for data gathering, we, we are trying to find the uh, validation of a questionnaire using Kronpech Alpha. And also, we, uh, for methodology, we used SPSS for uh, descriptive statistic. Also, we used something, a structure equation model, SEM, was applied using the partial least uh, uh, square because we have a complicated uh, a theoretical model, uh, which is using between the HRM practices and the mediating variables and the organization culture. Here, all the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis related to the link that what we found, uh, what we found, there is a direct relation. There is a direct relation between the human resource practices to organization performance, and also there is also a direct relationship between the HRM practices to the organization performance through the mediating variables. Uh, for qualitative, we have the organization culture. There, is, there, there was strong link between them, each other, Re employee retention. Also, we have a lower levels for, uh, for satisfaction, performance appraisal, high level for, uh, of satisfaction. Uh, results for qualitative, also training and development. We have both sides for the administrative group and we have for the academic group. For the administrative group, we have a p very positive uh, uh, from the uh, uh, administrative group. A training and development, we have more critical of the training opportunity and 
of the amount of the money that was conducted for the academic staff. Uh, key lesson for HR man managers, uh, what we advise the HR manager, uh, managers to have, uh, uh, to study more or to be deep for the culture. Also the second one, to uh, consult with the employee what the things that are going, uh, going on in the HR department. And the last one also to use the strategic wise especially for the HR, because we are now start, starting to be above the HR man, managers. We have to be as strategic wise, and if you have the questions, thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sorry Muhammad, for, for 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, because we are already bust off the time. Uh, I will open the, uh, the QA session, if you have, uh, but we do have just three minutes. So, please, for short questions. Yes? Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, can, can you just get us the slide of the conceptual model? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're using SEM, right? Exactly. So you're trying to find the best fit model. Exactly. Have you attempted to look at the relationship between organizational culture and HR in a different way, in a sense that rather than the arrow going from HR to organizational culture, it should be the culture who's affecting HR, because HR are not the people who are responsible for recruiting and training, etc. I think, just I think that, you, you are reading my mind.